simple phrase, but um, I think it's kind of um, being overused, to be honest with you. So when people hear from uh, people like us who you know, who have been there, done that, or are doing the right thing, that's that's where it's all it's all about the awareness of that, and that, that's in any line of work, actually. A absolutely, and I think in the at least in the in in the, in the fire service, I think we take this. We have a, a certain chunk of calls that I think everyone is like cool with like, nowadays that if if you experience, you know, you know, incidents A through D and you start to develop, um, you know, well, PTSD from it or signs of PTSD in our world, we're kind of uh, more accepting of that. And I think a lot of that's related to a, a, a call for a child, right? Like oh, if, if, if we go to a, a traumatic incident involving a kid and you fast forward like a little bit of time and a guy's struggling with it and they can cite that call, I think we're, we're at least turning a little bit of a, of, of a page here where that's accepted, where I think what we take for granted is our line of work, both police and fire departments, it is not a normal, like, it's not a normal, like, you know, day-to-day -day operation to, like, experience and deal with the stuff that we see um, uh, on, a, on a daily basis. You go to, for, like, a, a medic or a, a fire department, even police, like, you go to a cardiac arrest and somebody's, like, dying on the floor, like, that's our Tuesday. That's our Tuesday at 2 o'clock, right? Exactly. It's not like, but we take this for granted as if like, this is our normal, which is a crazy thought to think of when you like suck yourself out of the bubble for a second and think like that is not normal. Nothing of, it's probably more toxic than it is normal. Oh, and I used to actually use the word toxic quite a bit. And uh, studies have shown that the average person, non-first responder, uh, non-military experiences maybe one or two traumatic events in their whole lifetime. We as first responders, we were, we, 20 plus, if not more, uh, probably yeah. more my, would be my guess. And when we go to, when we go to an event such, such as, um, like you said, working a code, um, and you, you do your job and unfortunately the pa patient passes away and guess what? You got to load up your ambulance again. You got to get in your fire truck again. You get your police car again. And now you're going to answer another call. And, and that's eventually that's going to bear down on you. Uh, event, you, you, you Everybody can close their eyes and think of one event in the first responder world that you just say, holy crap, I, I can't believe that, I, that happened to me or I experienced that. But unfortunately, I don't think the public understands that too much. And again, that's where, again, like I said earlier, that's where public awareness comes in uh, to understand that. And one thing I've learned about the fire service, uh, you guys you guys nail it when it comes to peer support, is because, and, uh, and I've heard this from several firefighters and I have witnesses with, with several firefighters, you guys have that kitchen table. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's your that's your therapy. That's your group therapy. Uh, that's your ball busting. Uh, that's just having some laughs and also getting serious. All that. Now, the flip side of the law enforcement thing is we do um, we do the car to car. You know, you park like this and uh, yep. you're doing that. Or if you have a good if you have a good boss, and I'm not bragging when I say this. I <laughs> for 19 years, but I was a good boss because I, I cared about my people. So after every major event or semi-major event or an event there where I think this, you know, we need to talk about this, uh, we would get, get together, everybody grab their coffees, the two o'clock morning, let's go behind Home Depot, let's go behind a school, and let's 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 talk about that. And that's what we we we've got to talk about it. You know, it, it. This is nothing new. Suicide goes back to biblical days, and uh PTSD, PTSI goes back to the Civil War, if not longer before that. So here we are in 2023, and we're going. What, what do we do about this? Well, I, it's a very easy fix. It's extremely easy. And I've seen through my career also, it's easier to get rid of you than it is to keep you. And yeah. That's a, that's a shame. That's, that's a, that is just a, when I say disgusting, that's disgusting. Now, some first responders that come down with a mental health illness and they can't, and they say, Hey, I can't do the job anymore. I give them all the kudos in the world for that because it takes, it takes a very tough person to go to their boss and say, this is not for me anymore. And that's yeah. a real tough part. And I don't mean to cut you off. Like that was a, that's a real, that's a real interesting like thing in, in the, in the fire services. When you have those issues, when you have like someone that is, is leaving for whatever reason, and it might not be a reason that they're a big fan of maybe um, health wise, they, they leave financially, right. they leave. Um, right. You have, <laughs> you have a faction of, of folks that, that are, are genuinely, you know, um, you know, you know, uh, upset or, 
um, you know, uh, sympathetic to why they're leaving. And then you have this other faction. It's probably larger than what people realize is the, now people are going through, okay, well, well, now I can promote, you know, now, right. now you see the wheels turning a lot of times with administration where just by virtue of their responsibilities, they start to go into, okay, well, he's leaving. He, you know, we don't care. He has two weeks left. He's out the door. We don't care about him anymore. We have to replace him. And then that culture starts to develop into promotions and testing. And now suddenly you have this person that for whatever reason that they're leaving before they're even gone, it feels like they're already forgotten, you know? And it's very simple. Very, very simple. And I, 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 I learned that also after I retired. Um, I, 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 and I, I always tell the story. I, re, I retired on a Thursday at two o'clock and we had take home cruisers. So the point yeah. of that is Friday morning, about nine, 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm driving to the gym. What do I get behind? My Your cruiser. Yeah. <laughs> wow, the body's not even cold. Yeah, you know. <laughs> right. Right. And, and it just made me think, all I am is a number. That that's that's all I am. And I and I like what you said, because when I announced my retirement, there was probably a handful, if not more, people that said, Oh, hey, you know, there's a sergeant opening right now. So now I gotta start sucking up. Now I yep. gotta, I gotta sell my soul. And not, not everybody does that. Unfortunately, a lot of people do do that. And but when I saw that, when I got behind that cruiser, that really, really hit home. That wow, I'm just just a number. And then when I caught up to the uh, the cruiser at red light, I looked over to my right. And I looked over. And I can be honest, it was a deputy I didn't like. Oh, <laughs> son of a bitch! They gave you. Yeah, I know. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what is going on here? But right, right there. That just resonated right there. And when I retired, my phone didn't stop ringing. Here we are, four and a half years later. I hear from maybe a handful of people, if not, yeah. if not less. And uh, at first it bothered me, you know, but then I thought, you know, the people that still reach out to me, I reach out to them. Those are my brothers and my sisters. The others were just co-workers. Yeah. And I think we, and it, it's, it's tough because I think on the job, we, we, we characterize the, the brother and sister term, I think as a way to uh, hold everybody together. I think while they're all together, right? Like, like it's kind of, we use it as like this, um, uh, occupational glue for our for our industry, right? Because we don't want to alien like we don't want to go out of our way. Some do, but we don't want to go out of our way, especially the people that we enjoy working with, to alienate them. But right. I think when that when and, and that when that R word hits, that retirement word hits. You know, I've heard it from from you know a lot of people where, um, n not nearly the level of, of people that reach out to them like they thought they would. You know, if you work with 30 right. people, I think you're expecting 25 to reach out to you on a daily basis. And it's this, um, and I've heard from other people that have left my agency where it's this like stark, unexpected reminder that like they were, they were your friends at work, but sometimes there are people that are just coworkers. And when, when you leave the job, you know, you're leaving them too. And I think it's super yeah. tough to, to, um, like I, I think it's a lot like a lot of times when the fire service you a lot of guys wrap themselves into this profession they become this profession they get tattoos of it i'm you know i'm no different but um right. they really wrap themselves in it so when that goes away and if it goes away unexpectedly that's a super a super challenging thing i think that people have to deal with and i don't think that they're i think you know built to uh, built to deal with because I think so often too, you know, we fix things. We are called when things are, people are bothered by things and other people. And then when we don't have that and we're not in an emergency, it's a really tough, I, I would imagine it's a really tough world to live in. Well, coming out know, the job. We, we, we're trained to be helpers. That's what, you know, we, 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 you know uh, we, we're trained to be helpers, but then we don't recognize that we need help sometimes. And uh, or unfortunately, the agencies either look look the other way or they just don't care. You know, sometimes now there are some phenomenal agencies out there uh, that really take care of their people. Um, but yeah, yeah, you, you, you know, it's just again, like I said before, all you are is, is a number of people that you thought were your like your buddies or your brother and sister or whatever, and then you don't see them anymore. But I think one thing also we're, we're forgetting to mention is this: is that um, in the police and fire service, is it becomes our, our identity. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I can think of so many times in the firefighters an example is uh, rolling up on a vehicle crash, and all of a sudden this truck pulls up, and this guy goes, "I'm a firefighter. Can I help you with something?" I'm an EMT, I'm a paramedic or whatever. And that's phenomenal. 
And, and even after four and a half years later, I, I, when I drive down the street and I look over and I see a traffic stop, I slow down to take a look. Um, and if, if, if I see a cop speaking with somebody, I, I, I watch them. And I'll be the first one to jump in if it turns to shit. Yeah, you know, um, right. but so, so it becomes our identity. And, uh, but slowly I've learned to trickle away from you with becoming my identity. But, um, but you know, you, you, you go into this, you go into this, this service for a reason. And you only get out of it what you put into it. And uh, which sometimes is difficult because sometimes the more effort you put into it, if you're not politically correct or you're not one of the boys, you're not going to get a heck of a lot, heck of a lot out of it. And that causes stress also. Yeah, hundred percent. What um so Mark, what took you on this journey that you're on right now? You said you you put in over thirty years on the job. Um what what I guess what brought you into law enforcement at first and then if you don't mind talking about like how how you transitioned and how like your your career ebbed and flowed to where you are now. Sure. Well, all my life, all my life, I wanted to be a be a cop. You know, go, going back to the uh, the old TV shows, Adam Twelve, SWAT, TJ Hooker. I'm, I'm probably showing my age here, but um, <laughs> it's just you're know, probably like, what are those shows? <laughs> so you know, my favorite all time TV show is Emergency. Okay. Well, I'm I'm well aware. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a familiar. great show. I can I can tell you the med starting IV fifty one TKO all that all that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I missed my call and I don't know. Right. Right. But all my life I wanted to be a cop. I I I when I was a kid I idolized police officers. I thought they were the greatest things. Uh, and I remember a, a cop that um, you know living in a big city. You had walking beats. Um, and the cop that had the walking beat in my neighborhood was Frankie Calabro, and uh, he was just such a cool guy. He just he just he just really was, you know? <laughs> and, and 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 I and I grew up I grew up without a dad, and so I kind you know I kind of looked up to him uh, with that. Then when I started getting older, like into my like uh, you know mid teens or whatever, I said, "Why well, I, I got to really focus on if I want to be if I want to be a cop and how I can make it happen." And uh, I, I went through some uh, some difficult times growing up. If you don't mind me mentioning about that, um, I, I was sexually abused uh, when, when when I was a kid. Uh, that that was very 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 hard to handle, um, and then my my mother raised three of us, and uh, we grew up in a very very small home um, where we had, we had to share bedrooms. Um, we, we sometimes we were wondering where our next meal was going to come from, and um, so at the age of sixteen, I quit school and I decided I wanted because my mother work, was working one time she was working two full time jobs, and that's an amazing person, truly amazing person. She's my mentor, and. Um, so I quit school. Um, I worked a full time job, a part time job, but it, but I couldn't I couldn't become a cop if I you know, as a high school dropout, for lack of a better word. So I went back and got my GED when I was nineteen, and I started at twenty one. I started in a small police department right outside of Boston, uh, Braintree, Mass. And I got to tell you, bro, that was like the most amazing, the amazing thing ever happened to me. My mom pinned my badge on my chest. I when I, at the swearing in ceremony. And I said, I am going to rock and roll. I'm, I'm going I'm to be that cop that arrests everybody. <laughs> you know, you, 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 you they pull over everybody. And I did. And it, it, was, it was a lot, a lot of fun. But one thing I learned really quick in my career was you have to have empathy and compassion for people, your coworkers and the people that you serve and your family and friends also. So um, I, um, I saw a lot of stuff earlier in my career. I went, we went on to the Amtrak police where I saw a lot of tragedy working for the Amtrak. I saw a lot of people hit by trains. I saw a lot of suicides. Um, and it started taking a toll on me a little bit. And I'm like, you know, what, you know, what, you know what, what, why are people doing this? But why am I laughing about this? You know, and uh, which is, which, you know, we have a weird sense of humor. There's no question about that. And I'm not making excuses for that by any means. But it's true. I mean, like it, it's, you know, you, you, you actually end up doing it. The, the, right. the, not, not the more horrific, but you have a horrific incident. It's not uncommon for first responders to walk away and crack a joke about it. Sure, sure, yeah. sure absolutely. And uh, so, and, and our coping skill was, was way back when, was uh, we called it choir practice. We went behind the police station, went to a school, went to a park after after shift, grabbed a bunch of beers, sat in a circle and talked. And we did talk um, on like like on a peer support level, but nobody showed any type of emotion because we were afraid that oh my god, what if I cry or what if I uh, get pissed off? You know, then uh, they're gonna think um, bad of me. So from there, from there, I went on to I moved to Florida and uh, worked for a small department it's called Avon Park. I worked there for a year, and I went to uh, Simmel County Sheriff's Office where I did. Um, 25 years there and I retired as a patrol sergeant. So um, 
the only way to, the, the way the way to word this was um, is was I had a bad boss. I, I had a horrible, horrible boss that was a micromanager, a bully, punk, demeaning, would talk down to you. Now, you know, you know I was I used to tell him to f off. But obviously, that's not going to get me anywhere fast. <laughs> yes, that's not. Yeah. So I became very rebellious, and uh, but he uh, he would just like jab me and 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 write me up and and insult me in front of people and on and on and on. And after a while, it wears and tears on you. So I tried to have that. Hey, man, we're not getting a long talk. I understand you're my boss, but listen, this isn't cool. It just got ten times worse than that. And he was always one of the boys. Uh, you know, the, the, he hung out with the administration. It's their butts the whole the whole nine yards. Yeah, part of that part of that uh, afternoon uh, afternoon lunch crew, you know. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I never fit into that circle. And honestly, yep. never really wanted to be in that circle either. So uh, that was starting to take a toll on me. And then um, the traumas of the job also was starting to take a toll on me. Also, well, I got an evaluation from this person, and it was a below standards evaluation, which I never was a below standards uh, 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 copy my, my my whole career. And, and he also recommended me uh, either to be demoted or be terminated. But the guy that would hide behind the keyboards, and here's what I mean by hiding behind the keyboards. Chris, if I, if, if, you are, if I was your boss and I do your evaluation, when we sit down and look at your evaluation, you should never be surprised what's in that evaluation. Go right. to, you should never be surprised. Well, I call them keyboard tough guys because like, like the YouTube warriors, yeah, you know, they- Oh, uh, yeah. yeah they, uh, they, they, so, so that was taking a toll on me also. And then the trauma is the job. And I'll give you an example. I went to 9-11. I was in 9-11. I went to New York uh, three days after, three or four days after the buildings were hit. Now, were you activated through Seminole County? Or how yeah, I was. You... Yeah, okay. I was. And that's that, actually, that was a true blessing. It really was because I was on edge. I got to do something for our country. You know, I mean, and, I, I, and uh, the sheriff fortunately sent up uh, about 10 of us. And it was absolutely amazing. One thing I, I really recall is when I got there, and I got I got out of my cruiser, and two things happened. Number one, the fumes and the dust was 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 nasty, and it hit it hit me in the chest like 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 somebody hit a baseball bat across. I had had asthma attack from that. But the point I'm getting was I also smelled death, and it was nasty. It was a nasty nasty smell, and it, it and during the whole time I was up there, we had a lot of laughs and jokes, but it was kind of somber also. Like the lot of NYPD, FDNY were just kind of walking around. They're kind of just doing their own thing. And at the ground, at, at the ground zero site, at the World Trade Center site, there was a tent. And all it said was on the tent was a sign, let's talk. And uh, I'm like, really? who the hell would go in there and talk to those people? You know, you, seriously? Yeah, you know, I, I thought to myself. So I looked over by the tent when I walked by, and a guy looks at me, he goes, How you doing, bro? I said, Good man, how you doing? He goes, Why don't you have a seat and give a, talk to us for a couple minutes? I go, No, nah, man, I'm busy. I, I wasn't busy, but I just said, no, there's no way I'm going to go in that tent. There's going to be a hidden camera in there or something or, or what, you know? So yeah. I came to Florida and I was dealing with that also. And, um, but I think what really, really hit home was the, the bullying at work. What really, I mean, it just was, you know, we're not supposed to be doing this to each other. And then I went, I went, I, um, I was sitting in the fire station one night and it was about one o'clock in the morning. I was sitting in the driveway. The FD went out on a call <clears throat> and I'm sitting there. And all of a sudden, this car pulls in, and this woman jumps out of the car. She hands me, we talked about this earlier, hands me a four month old baby and says, My baby's not breathing. Shit. I don't care how much of a tough guy, tough girl you think shit. you are. Shit. Yeah, that's an old shit moment. I don't care. Yeah. He says, I reached, I checked his pulse, wasn't breathing, bro. The radio, you know, have the FD step on it, you know, blah, 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 and, yeah. and on and on and on. And uh, doing compressions, I got the pulse back. I'm like, oh, Man, this is amazing, bro. This is amazing. And then I lost the pulse again. FD transports, make a long story short, I was in the emergency room when they pronounced the baby dead. Uh, and that was, that was, that was tough. Okay. I was holding the baby's hand. I was emotionally attached to this baby. Yeah. That. Um, that led me now to um, have panic attacks, have nightmares. I was having nightmares of my sexual abuser. I was having nightmares of the, of the baby. Uh, I was hearing voices. And I had a massive weight gain. Um, I, I, and, and, you know, everybody, everybody, um, responds to stress differently. I respond to stress as from eating. I, you know, I, I used to, I was eating every McDonald's, Burger King, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, of course, uh, uh, or, or, uh, Dairy Queen and all that. And I gained a bunch of weight. And then my wife had a heart to heart talk with me. Listen, you've gained a lot of weight. 
you've been on the edge, you're not this nice person, and you need to get some help. And I looked at her and I said, you got to be kidding me. Cops don't get help. They're going to fire me. They're going to put me on the rubber gun squad. They're going to take away my badge and gun and put me in a corner. Obviously, that caused, that caused you know, marriage issues also. Sure. Um, and then, uh, so this this went on for probably about four or five months, and I was struggling. But and I, you know, to the point was I was afraid to go to sleep sometimes. So I used alcohol also as a as a um, um, as self medication, and I was drinking a lot after work. Then I started drinking before work. Then I started drinking while I was at work also. I used to keep a bottle of tequila in my equipment bag, and obviously that's a recipe for disaster. There's no sure. way to do that. Well, it came time for uh, CPR renewal, and uh, I'm there. I'm doing my compressions. I'm doing everything good and all that stuff. <clears throat> The uh, to do the the the, the, the infant part of it, the instructor handed me the um, oh, the fuck. Hand, and I I fell face first, had a panic attack, and I'd never in my life had a panic attack before. The sweats, the chest pains, the dry mouth, the uh, the dry heaving, um, my head spinning. I'm like, what the hell is going on here? You know, this doesn't we this doesn't happen to me. I'm a, I'm a tough cop. This is you know I used to work in the toughest neighborhoods and all that. And then uh, it's, it's that that's that, that took a toll on me also. And then one night I was sitting in my cruiser, and I started reevaluating my reevaluating my career, my life, my marriage, and there was nothing positive at all. Um, and just like just like that, I got a suicide thought. Never in my life have been ever a suicide thought. Now, hear me out when I say this, this, this uh, Chris. Mm-hmm. Studies have shown that in the police world, um, that 87, co- 87% of cops that die by suicide, they die in their uniform, and they die either in their cruiser or at their station. Why is that? They're sending a message. Okay. Yeah, look, look what you did to me. I can't, I can't believe you did this to me. Maybe it's like passive aggression. Or- sure. Or something like that. So I, so I got the suicide thought, and I said, "Oh, that you know, only crazy people get suicide thoughts. You know, that this this tough guy doesn't get suicide thoughts." And they became overwhelming um, to the point where my my head was like spinning. Um, so I took a piece of paper out and I wrote a suicide note, and I said, "My first line of that suicide note is, I'm showing you what you did to me, to my agency, to my boss, and some other people." The note was a nasty note, a lot of MFs. Uh, very, very nasty. Um, as you can tell, I have, I have a very outgoing personality. <laughs> I like to laugh, but this was this was serious stuff. Sure. Um, on the flip side, was a note to my mom. My, my mother was still alive then, and my and my uh, and, and to my mom, uh, and to my wife. And it was I called myself a coward in the in the uh, note. And uh, no, I love you. Just I'll see you again. And I hung that I hung that uh, piece of paper on my rear view mirror and I just stared at it and stared at it and stared at it. And um, I said, okay, yeah, it's time to go. It's definitely time to go. So I picked up my phone. This is where it gets, this is where it kind of gets really weird. Don't ask me why I did this. I really don't know. Uh, I called dispatch and said, uh, Hey, who's the on-call uh, homicide detective for, for my district. And the dispatcher said, Oh, it's this, uh, it's uh, Jennifer Spears. Who's actually a very good friend of mine. Still a good, one of the people that keeps in touch with me after, uh, you know, after I retired. And I said, okay, thanks. And the dispatcher said this to me. She goes, uh, you need something, Sarge? And I go, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good. You sure about that? So she knew she knew something was going on. I, there's, there's, there's no doubt about that. So I, I, um, I thought, now, yeah. Did, did that give you call? Like, was that calming to you when it was her? Uh, yeah, yeah, it, it was. Yeah, yeah, it was knowing my friend. Uh, and it, here's, here's how I was thinking. My, my friend Jennifer, who's the detective, will work my crime scene. She knows my wife. She knows my friends. She's a damn good cop, excellent cop. And I'm like, okay, this is good. That's calming. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. I never. I, it's really weird to think like that. So, now, had, now, had it been someone else, would you have? Would, do you think it would have altered, you know, your course if it was someone I, I else? May, yeah, I think it may have. Yeah, okay. I, I think it may have. Maybe that was like a, um, you know, some type of message or something like sure. that. Sure. You know. So uh, I took I took my gun out and a couple of times I just like looked at it and uh and I'm like, no, no, no way. And I put it back in my holster, took it back out again. I'm like, here we go. I put my head back, <clears throat> excuse me, put my head back, closed my eyes, I put the gun in my mouth. You just mentioned calming, it was extremely calming. Uh, really? 
day, I, I can taste the metal in my mouth. Now, I'm not being triggered by any means. I talk about this all the time. And I, uh, I started squeezing the trigger. As I'm squeezing the trigger, uh, a car pulls up next to me. Now, I'm in a way back in an industrial park. Way, I mean, you'd have to know where, where it is. And this is before GPS you know, and all, and all that stuff. And it be another deputy. His ne deputy's name was Craig McKee, who actually uh, uh, just died 14 years ago uh, of natural causes. So Craig looks at me and goes, uh, my nickname's Bone. And he goes, uh, Sergeant Bone, um, what are you doing? In my exact words, I looked at him and said, Craig, I'm going to fucking kill myself. And I said, I said, get the hell out of here. Get back in your zone. You know, what are you doing? This, that's an order. Get the hell out of here. He's like, I'm not going anywhere. And so the point I'm getting is he talked, he talked me down that night. He really did. That, that's a, that's a brother, man. That's a, and Craig and I we were friends from the day I started that sheriff's office. Uh, he's just, just an amazing, amazing guy. So um, he says to me also, Hey, Sarge, just so you know, they've called your cell phone. They've sent you messages on the computer. Uh, we have the helicopter up in the air. Uh, we have a bolo or be on the lookout for you. I'm like, really? I didn't hear any, I didn't hear I never heard my phone ring. I uh, never looked at my computer messages or anything like that. So, so is that the dispatcher, you think, activated that based on what you said? Um, I think so, yeah, because because one way or another, she had to call me on the radio, and I didn't answer. And then you're, normally what we do, if, if a cop doesn't answer, right away you say, what's their last location? Okay. So we can go to that. And I, I didn't work a call for like three or four hours because I just could care less. So I think maybe she did initiate that, yeah. Um, okay. So so I went I went I I went home early that morning. I made an excuse up to my to the watch commander that hey I'm not feeling good I need to go home and all that stuff. Well I went home I sat by my pool and it re I reacted again. Um, drinking heavily, got the gun at my table, and um, so I started thinking about it. And I said you know something this time there's nobody here to there's no there's nobody here to stop me, and uh, I said yeah this is actually a perfect opportunity. So I um, I put a um, I had my my CD player. But younger people listening to this uh, podcast, the CDs are round thing plays music. Yeah, you know, I, well, Mark, I'll tell you something. I uh, <laughs> I, I, I used to uh, frequent my a portable CD player in my pocket. Right on, um, my right over on. my oversized jeans in high school walking through there and tucking the nice. wire through my. Uh, <laughs> so I remember I remember these days quite well. So you were the cool <laughs> kid, man. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So I um, so I so I hit shuffle on my CD player, and when I hit shuffle, um, the song came on. Even the nights are better by Air Supply. It's a love song from the '80s. That was my song to my my wife at my for our wedding. And I said, "Okay, what the what the heck is that?" I hit shuffle again, and guess what? It comes on again. So now I'm pissed off at my CD player. <laughs> <laughs> <You're right. laughs> So I hit shuffle one more time, and the song comes on. And because uh, because I, I relate my life a lot to music, so that's why I'm, I'm mentioning this is that the song came out more than a feeling by Boston, which is my all time go-to. I love me song. And I'm thinking, wow, this is, this is pretty intense. So I uh, said, nope, nope, time to go. So I put the gun back in my mouth and I closed my eyes. And all I visualized was my wife standing over at our pool deck, standing over me. And, uh, you know, you, you've been, you've been to suicides, you know, oh, yeah. a bloody mess. Suicides. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and I visualized her do, and I said, no, that's, that's, you know that that's that's not cool. That's not, that's not cool at all. And when I was thinking about it, and I had to visualize of her, I felt this sense of calmness. And I felt honestly, I felt like like she touched my shoulder, touched my arm, even though she was we lived in a two story home. She was upstairs. Then I visualized my friend Jennifer going to the crime scene. I visualized the responding deputies, the fire department, uh, the crime scene, and then my, I visualized my wife explaining to my family why I did that. And I said, you know, yeah, I, I, I get, I got to get some help. I, I, I truly got to get some help. So I reached out to a buddy of mine um, that was in my wedding in uh, back home in Massachusetts in Boston, and uh, he was always big into mental health and all that stuff. And he gave me a program to go to Boston. So I went to the program, met him up there. Um, but let me back up for a second. I forgot to mention this. When I went up there, it was all lies. I caught. I emailed my patrol captain and said, "Hey, listen, my mother's sick. I need to go back up to Boston." I left a no. I, I I just told my wife, "Yeah, I'm gonna go back home for a couple of days, get my head straight, and go visit my mom, and you know, hang out with the boys, and and all that stuff." Yeah. So at this point, you're still not letting on that anything's no. wrong. No, no. And uh, so I got up to Boston. I became in, uh, non-compliant. Now I don't know what they they call it uh, in your area, but in Florida they call it a Baker Act, a 72-hour commitment to a mental health facility. 
Okay. Uh, gotcha. So, yeah. So I, I was, uh, I was involuntarily went, went, went to the, um, went to the hospital. I was handcuffed. I was put in the back seat. Uh, the cop that dro- drove me there was, I give you honestly, he, he was a total ass to me, just a total, total ass to me. Young, young kid. Um, so I, um, I, and, I, that, I, and that alone too is, is probably fucking your own brain up too, as you're right. like, just like pissed off at the world, you know, right. and, and like, 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 exactly what, what, the fuck, what, what the fuck is going on here. Right. Yep. You, you know? So, um, I, so when I say this being compliant, uh, not, not complied, I want, I want all the listeners to hear this, uh, hear me out when I say this is this, is that, um, it came to the point where I was putting four point restraints in a bed, hospital bed. Um, now visualize this for a second. You can't scratch your nose. Uh, you can't do anything. And all your liberties are gone from you. You can't get out of the bed. You can't even move or anything like that. And I had a, and I also had a catheter because I, I wouldn't give blood or urine. Um, oh. Oh. Yeah, that, that, that was friggin' brutal. But that's besides the point. <laughs> and the, the room was cold, by the way. So I, I get it. <laughs> oh, I know it was horrible. So um, this is not normally what I look mom, like. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom comes in the next day, and I told my mother, I said, "Get the straps off me," and she wouldn't do it. So I was pissed off on my mom also. So I, I went through the program. I'll be honest with you, I lied. I, I lied a lot in my program, came back to Florida, came back even more pissed off than I was uh, leaving Florida. So I decided I wanted to uh, become full transparent about this. So I went to my agency, and I'll be 100% honest with you when I say this, my agency turned their backs on me. They, uh, they, they And I, I did not expect that. I expected, you know, Chris, I expected this. Hey, bro, what can we do to help you? Let's let's hit, but it was it was the exact I was called a liability. I, I was mocked, I was made fun of. And that now, hurt. Now f- when you're getting that mocking from your leadership, is that you know w- age-wise, how were how were, were they uh, of a different generation than you? Were they did they come from a different segment? I say segment, but I guess a different time frame of the police force, or were they just ingrained in that kind of toxic culture where um, you know, if, if, if you don't see it, you don't have to believe it sort of thing. That's, that's what it's about. Yeah. Cause it was just, there was different array of ages, different array of rank and all that stuff. So I think, um, I think what, I think I blindsided them. Obviously I did. Um, and I thought they, they probably thought that, Hey, listen, we don't have these issues in our agency. Well, it was a big department. I wasn't the only person struggling in that department by, by any means. So I decided to become an advocate for law enforcement mental health. And here's why I thought of it. I said, you know something? I'm not the only person that's ever felt this way. I'm not the only cop that's ever put their gun in their mouth. I'm not the only cop that was in verge of losing their marriage, losing their careers, uh, losing their life. I'm not the only one. So here's, here's what I got to do. I got I to now, I got I to help others. So I was in a training class, and the person that was speaking in the training class about mental health no clue, no clue whatsoever when it came to that. So I asked if I could speak and I spoke very angry to the point where it got me written up because I used to swearing a lot. I was very aggressive. So I had, obviously I had to tone it down. So then I, um, I joined an organization, um, and it was, it, it went well, but I still wasn't focused in the right way. I was spoke, I, I like, like I was talking in a, in a presentation, my agency screwed me over. I thought this was, this person was a friend of mine. I thought this girl was my sister. And I said, my wife goes, listen, she went to some of the uh, uh, presentations. She's like, you speak very angry. And she goes, I want you to use your personality that you have. You're funny. You like to laugh. You, you, you can grasp people when you talk and do that. So I turned it around. And that definitely helped. Well, obviously, therapy helped also. I still see the same therapist um, since 2008. I still see the, I, I still see the same therapist. Uh, she put me on medication. That was kind of tough to deal with, to be honest with you. Um, but it helped. Totally. But she taught me that sometimes you have to let the past go and move on from it. And instead of being pissed off about it, be the change. Don't be that uh, person that um, that's always walking around F this place and blah, blah, blah. I was a very outspoken person. If you, if you wanted the answer, you're going to get the, if you want to answer the question, you're going to, you're going to get the answer. So I uh, eventually I, 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 um, I, I found my own, my own organization, protecting the guardian. I'm one of the, I'm one of the co, I'm one of the co-founders of that. And we, uh, it's going really, really well. We, we, um, we just switched over to being a nonprofit, so hopefully that will open more avenues for us. But more so, Chris, the answer to your question was, I, I want to show others that mental health illness can happen to anybody, and not just in the first responder world. Anybody, 
the um, the Circle K clerk, the um, or anybody, everybody deals with demons. Like I said earlier, de deals with an in incident, but more so in the first responder world, we're, we're really told not to talk about it in a, in a roundabout way. Now, some departments will have a peer support unit, and some of them are very good. Some aren't that very. Good. Some of them, all they are, is a checkbox, and it's called CYA, cover your ass. You, you know, and uh, I've seen through my career too many good first responders being tossed away. In my opinion, they were savable. All they needed was somebody to reach out there and take it by the hand, and say, "Hey, bro, come on, let's go. We're gonna, we're gonna get you through this." And, yeah, uh, when you were when three, when you were going through your you know when you're going through therapy and whatnot, did you have a struggle with finding a a, a, a therapist that you could actually connect with or oh oh absolutely <clears throat> i did yeah yeah my, my current therapist the one that, that i connected with her name is jamie jamie bridges she's a retired cop she went through she went through her struggles first time i met her we just we, we that's the one that's the one right there i went to one mental health professional which i thought was really really strange i walked into his office and i'm in the waiting area and there was a poster of the buildings falling down at 9 11. <laughs> Obviously, that triggered me. I'm like, oh my god! Yeah, you know, I started getting you know, right heaves, and, and I'm like, what is, what is, who, who does that? You know, he call, calls me into his uh, into his office, and I'm sitting at the chair, and I'm looking around. He's got pictures on the wall of him shaking hands with like chiefs of police, sheriffs, and all that stuff. And I'm like, there's no way I can be in my comfort zone here. And and I remember he had skinny jeans on. And I was kind of like, okay, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. You know, it's just like. That's kind of weird. And he kept saying to me, I get this. I get this. So I asked him, I said, are you any type of first responder? No. I don't, I don't think you really get this, you know? So he turned me off. So I, so I, then, then I just on a fluke, I found my, my present therapist, Jay, I just on literally on a fluke, I found her and amazing, just truly amazing. Yeah. I will say that was, you know, some of the resources that, that we have, you know, you have some some agencies, and I, I don't want to paint the agency. I'll paint more the uh, the 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 municipality. Let's say, um, that's one huge disconnect. I think that is not valued. I think as heavily because you know we'll get some bullshit like one eight hundred number to a twenty four seven therapy like therapy session, right? Um, we have a we have we have a guy on our agency that was uh, worked. Um, down in one of our bigger cities in Michigan. And he was attacked. Like, you know, you can look him up, up on Google. I mean, he was like, damn, you know, face was slashed. Um, I mean, wow. really went through some some gruesome shit on a on a patient um, or patient or the patient's family that really got combative. And part of his requirement to come back to work uh, was therapy. And he kept rejecting it because like you just said, everyone was like, yeah, I, I get I get where you're coming from. Really? Have you seen what I've seen? Have you done what I've done? Right. And the answer is always no. It wasn't until he found someone that was a former first responder that awesome. that that actually could talk to him in a manner that was um, not so much I know what you're going through, but could give you that like that form of I don't know if it was ball busting or like let a conversation as if you were at the bar with just mm -hmm. out alcohol, right? right. Where right. Just tell me, and tell me what happened or someone that, you know, knows what it's like to walk into a hostile environment and, and have those sort of, sort of interactions. So I think that part that, that you're referring to with your therapist and what exists from, from my experiences too, is such a huge key to the lock of, of really helping first responders out is getting those therapists wherever they are in the country that have experience on the job, whether that's in police or fire or, for the first responder world you know and that and that's paramount that that, that truly truly is uh now are there good therapists that uh, yeah they're good therapists that are not first responders sure they may be related to a first responder they may be a, a spouse of a first responder sure. but but every first responder wants some type of connection with with, with their mental health professional now um so that, that I've, i'm a big advocate for that all the time and i get i get a lot of people come out to me and, and ask me hey you, you know any uh, mental health professionals in this area here or whatever and I, I i when i say i have a thousand one connections i literally have a thousand one connections. every conference that i go to i take business cards from people and i talk with them and, and you know and, and all that but yeah you have to you you've got to be when it comes to when it comes to therapy you've got to be in that comfort zone because um it, you know and, and i heard i heard a therapist say this one time at a conference that actually made me laugh 
Therapy is more than laying on the couch and telling your therapist, your mother ruined your life. <laughs> yeah. And I thought I found that pretty funny. Yeah. You know, but yeah, in, I, in, in my version of that going into my therapist and saying my agency ruined my life, that's not going to work, you know, because I accept full responsibility for my actions also, because I wasn't the model employee there by any means. And, um, so I have to learn, people have to learn from their mistakes also. Um, but when it comes to, again, when it comes to therapy, you also, one thing about therapy is you have to be open for something that you might not want to do in therapy, such as like, I don't know if you're familiar with EMDR. The mm. uh, uh, EMDR is basically, they dim the lights and you follow this light and it's, it's it, honestly, it's kind of creepy. Uh, yeah. They help, but, it, but it, they put you into a spot where you can see what's going on and it, it helped me quite a bit. But I think one of the biggest issues I had was when 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 I was prescribed a mental health uh, uh, drug, you know, when I went to, when I went to the pharmacy, I, you know, I wore like sunglasses. Uh, you know, what I mean, I'm trying to be like, right? Hey, yeah, yeah. Now I know I know the pharmacist by name. Hey, you got my happy milk? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so so it's just yeah, you have to be accepted, and it's not it's not career ending uh, to a point. It's not career ending. Let me take that back. Um, but just you have to be open to all things, but more so you have to be open to hearing hearing things that you don't want to hear, such as well, you know, you shouldn't have said that. Here's maybe why they rebelled against you, or you, or this, that, and the other thing. And I had a hard time with that at first because I always thought I was right about everything. In all reality, you know, I made I made some mistakes. Made a, actually made a lot of mistakes. But when you condone people for their mistakes, that's that's not helping them. That that's obviously hurting them. And I was just talking to somebody recently. And uh, they were telling me about they had a coworker die by suicide, and this person was out of state. He goes, you know, I, I I always thought there was something going on with him, but I never asked him. I go, why? None of my business. Well, yeah, actually, it is your business, because you work with these people day in and day out, time after time. You get to know their mannerisms. You get to know something about their personal life, their families, their work ethic, on and on and on. So um, if you can have a difficult conversation with the public, get you conversation with a co-worker that's what yeah. i was just going to say like the that difficult because that seems like a very tough time to have a difficult conversation if you are struggling to be receptive to any sort of discussion on how you're feeling on a triggering event that one you might not even know that triggering event that led you over the edge but then you also have to go into it and be told like one Tell us that it's not your fault that you are having these traumatic like right. incidents and you are having these thoughts, but also like it, it can be taken as you have to take like a fault, but it's more ownership or responsibility that you know you weren't a fucking saint leading up to this point too. So, exactly. you know, you have to accept some culpability in maybe your interactions with you know X, Y, and Z person to help right. you understand like. It, it didn't just flip this way overnight. They still suck for what they did or it still sucks for what you experienced, but there's a bigger, it sounds like there's just like a bigger piece to the puzzle that makes it probably very challenging for someone to have to like, you know, admit that, but also like admit the, the I guess, what they're receiving too, I guess if that makes sense. Yeah, and like I said, you know, you know uh, and, and certain things for, work for certain people, you know, you know what I mean? And, uh, like, like one of the things I've learned also in my recovery phase was also is um, I had to kind of, again, stop, stop being so pissed off. But it was so it was so hard because, you know, you 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 have those thoughts in, in your head, you know, and especially if you see somebody, oh, oh, this guy, this guy's an asshole. Yeah. You know what I mean? you're, and, and you're like, OK, but but you have to learn that also. And I've, I've, I've learned that also. And one thing that was that turned around in my life also was is um, is I became a Christian. And, uh, I, you know, I, 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 I uh, you know, my wife and I became a Christian at the same time. We, we found the Lord, found Jesus. And that, you know, that's helped us quite a bit also. Now, were and, you not religious beforehand? No, no, okay. no. I, I mean, I, you know, I believed in God, but I'm like, you know, yeah, whatever. Yeah, yeah, you know. Sure. And so, and then when I, when I started really starting to research uh, Christianity and uh, things like that, I, I'm like, well, this actually, you know, makes, makes a, like, like a lot of sense. And one of the things that turned me on to becoming a uh, becoming a Christian was Isaiah six eight, which said, "The Lord said, Who shall I send?" I said, "Send me." That that nails it for the first responder world. That to in a military, that totally nails it right right there. So that's helped me quite a bit also. And then, um, and it's, like I said earlier, you know, stepping outside your comfort zone, like with medication. Uh, about four or five years ago, I bought a guitar, I bought a keyboard, 
and I like to play it. You know, I'm never going to be on stage or anything like. That. It's fun. It's, it's, yeah. it's, I grew my hair out. You know, I got all tatted up, and uh, it is just it's like you know. Like, I'll get me honest. Life is really it's really good. Yeah, you know. But I, I what it breaks my heart is to see somebody struggling. I, it just it really you know. And there's a line that I use all the time in my presentations: "Not all scars are visible." And that that's 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 just like 100 true. Now I had somebody say to me. Um, not too long ago, and at first it set me off, uh, said, hey, listen, diabetes, you can't help getting diabetes. Cancer, you can't help get cancer, okay? These are all things that are going to kill you someday if you don't control that. Mental health illness, you chose that. And I, uh, uh, yeah, oh, yeah. Old Mark was like, uh, I, you know, I, I took that breath. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, and I, and I, and I said, no, nah, bro. And I said, no, nah, no, nah, you're, 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 you're totally wrong. And he's like, uh, so he's going like this. Well, you know, like he was, I'll give you an example. My, my grandfather that died of cancer. I saw him whittle away to, to 90 pounds. He died of cancer. That was absolutely horrible. Of course it was. Of course it was totally horrible. I wouldn't wish that on anybody. But I said, have you ever seen a person, somebody suffer with a mental health illness who they're being made fun of? They're, uh, they're crying themselves to sleep. They, they're putting a mask on, the fake mask or anything like that. No, no, not really. I go, it's the same thing, bro. It's, it's totally the same thing. Because mental health is also, is also physical. You know, the, the pain and, and, and that. And he looked at me. He goes, so you have no compassion for physically ill people? I'm like, Ooh. That's not what I'm saying. You're, you're missing yeah. the point. Right, right. So I, so my, I finished up with this. I'm going to pray for you. That's, 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 that's you know, I, and and uh, so I know I pissed him off. And honestly, he, he kind of pissed me off a little bit also. Years ago, I've been like, listen, let me tell you what's going on with this. And this is a bunch of crap and blah, blah, blah. Now I'm like, all right, bro, you get your opinion. Like anybody else has their opinion. I, I'm going to pray for you. And that made me feel really good, actually. Yeah, I think, too, if if the first responder community was like, like if we were truly honest on that initial job interview, we would have nobody that did, like did this job, right? If you if you sat someone down and you're like, all right, Mark, welcome to the job interview. Um yeah, we're gonna give you a gun, some handcuffs for 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 our industry, right? Yeah, we're gonna give you, we're gonna give you a cool red truck. You'll get some gear, right? That gear is gonna have cancer in it. You're gonna to go to fires with cancer in inside the house. You're gonna see things you've never seen before in your life, and uh, well, no one's gonna really know how to react to it. Now, either you, you're gonna love alcohol, probably get divorced. Um, the the politicians are gonna have control over your pensions and your retirement. And, uh, well, when, when you're all like said and done with that one, you're going to throw a couple of dead bodies in there and that's just week one. Yeah. Uh, where do you sign? Right. Like, like yeah. and, and we wish you the best of luck with that also. Right. Yeah. And, and so when you said the thing about like, you chose it, yeah, you, you chose to get into this career, but what manifests over this career is, is, is not at all what you signed up for. You accept that as part of your normal throughout your career. But I think you know, we preach a lot of leadership at, at some points, especially if you climb rank, but you know, a tagline that that's connected to leadership is development. And I think we do a shitty job at development, both, oh, totally, totally. both leadership wise, but also just developing, developing professionals in the field. You know, you shouldn't have to go, you shouldn't go your whole career um, and, and, and promote up the chain and you know, not be like helped along by your leadership to like convert a, a word file to a PDF. Right? Exactly. So if you, if you are climbing, like that's part of the development, you are becoming more of a professional. But I think that goes back to what you were saying with empathy is if you don't have that empathy for people that you're working for and you're just in it as a, a, a superior and the people that beneath you are viewed as an inferior, well, then you're going to keep that line in the sand the whole time um, of your career. And, you know, I'm not going to give away where, where I work and where I live, but, um, a couple, uh, a short time ago, I don't know if you remember the, um, news with the Oxford high school shooting in Michigan. Um, yeah. it's been on the news a lot with the parents that have per the like, parents purchased the firearm, gave it to the, 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 gave it to the, the, the kid. He killed four people in the high school. And then now they're charging the parents, um, almost like equal culpable for, for the crime so our agency sent four members up there two of them like were got into got into the high school um another two took victims to that and what has come out of that is you know we a couple of years later are, are are seeing a a varying degree of manifestations of that trauma that 
are way va- are vastly different than I think the expectation is. I think the expectation that our former leadership had at the time, the fire chief at the time, who has since left, was if you didn't go, then you have no problems, right? So when they did a big after action review and they invited every everybody that was allowed to go could go, but if you weren't immediately connected to that incident, you weren't at work, you didn't go up there, you didn't provide any sort of aid, the view by one in particular person was, and he was, he was the highest level that we had, was very much, I don't know why you think you need to go, you weren't there. And a lot of these individuals had family up there that had kids in right. the school that had, um, you know, their moms were like, they, they came from that community, some of them graduated from that school. And they knew the teachers that were there. Uh, and so it, even in this, and this only happened a couple of years ago, but the messaging, you know, was very much like if y- you weren't there, you shouldn't have a problem. Or I don't know why you, ha- like, I don't know why you didn't have a problem. You were only there for a short time sort of thing. Right. And that's what just gives you like, you can just feel the PTSD washing over everyone sure. at sure. that point. Um, how it, it and one of the areas that we have found after that after action review was how starkly different the responses were. You had individuals that were just like, um, you know, dealing with it, just accepting it, just kind of living with it at the moment. And then you had other individuals that were, you know, breaking down and crying in front of everyone. Um, and it just, and, and, but we are now seeing like just a, a, a varying degree of transition because you go from that and, Two weeks later, you have another cardiac arrest, and two weeks later, you have a, you know, you 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 go for a a welfare check on someone, and the law enforcement has to you know call, notify family, have to deal with that grief, and it's um it's it's wild. And and what I say, what I mean by all this, and why I bring it up is, how have you seen the or is it the same or how is it how does it differ from your experience for law enforcement to handle um ongoing ptsd versus the fire service um is it a little more compartmentalized because in the in the law enforcement world because they don't have the kitchen table kind of like we were talking about earlier um yeah yeah i i, I would say that but i think what i've i've learned now is that um a lot of agencies are now saying okay this is a problem all right uh, it's not, the answer is not drink it away or uh, smoke it away or, what, or whatever. Okay, they, they they realize that's not the answer, uh, and I think they're realizing now that um, also is this: if uh, if a cop is shot in the line of duty, all right, critically injured, and they 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 yeah you know, they go they, hey they say to the cop, listen, workers' comp's got you covered. You come back to work when you're ready. We're gonna we're gonna do a fundraiser for you. We're going to uh, do all this stuff, which is beautiful, absolutely, absolutely beautiful, as it should be. But when a cop is struggling with mental health issues, you don't get that same reaction that, that you uh, that you do with a physical injury. So, but I think now the agency is tired to see that, that, you know, this is this goes hand in hand. And then, like, I, I, when I was listening to you talk, the secondary trauma of, of, of what goes on. Uh, like, you, you, you can explain to me, hey, listen, I worked this code on this person, and on and on and on. I can I can relate to it, but only to a point. But I can relate to the stress that you were under, and I can relate to the uh, sure math if the person dies uh, or something like that. So I think it's I think it is getting better. I, uh, but I mean, so it's a lot different when I first started back in 1985. It's a, it's a it's a lot better then, and uh, which is good. But I still see that uh, you know mental health wellness is just a checkbox. It's just. I get a, I, my department, my agency is going to cover their butt by, by doing something. So we're going to, we're going to have you guys watch this hour video of somebody talking about blah, 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 on and on and on. And that's your mental health training for the year. That's, that's, that's obviously a bunch of crap. That's what that's, that's, that's what that is. You need to hear from people that have been there, done that, uh, or have a personal connection to that somehow. So to answer your question, uh, Chris, I think it has got better, uh, but I don't think it's, it's not at the point where it should be by, by any means, but maybe, you know, hopefully maybe someday it will, you know? So the structure of your organization right now, what the, I know you guys transitioned to a, to a, to a 501 C. So, you know, 
we know the mission, right? But but yeah. how how is it delivered? How do you guys get it out there? How do people okay. like you know what's you know what's the grind of uh, of what you guys do? So we we go to a lot of conferences. I, I go I I probably do the most of the speaking for the agency. I go I go to a lot of conferences, go to a lot of training events, uh, do media work, podcasts, uh, things like that. So that's how we we, we get the word out. And uh, like I'll Google like police conferences or first responder conferences. And I'll put in to speak, and uh, and I speak I, I speak quite a bit. We, we we let me let me be very clear when I say this. We're not in to make money. That's that's not by any means. Now, obviously, a nonprofit you don't, you don't make money. But right. The, and that is this: if if a department called us up and said, "Hey, listen, we have a very limited training budget, or maybe no training budget, but we'd love you guys to come in and talk," we're not we're not going to tell them no. You know, not not by not literally not by any means. Uh, I do uh, here in Orlando. Um, I do usually twice a month. I speak at the uh, critical incident training uh, training for the for the officers, and I do the officer wellness portion of that. So we do a lot of that. Uh, but most most of it's all is like public you know public awareness at conferences. Um, it doesn't have to be a mental health conference. It could be pretty much anybody that's wants wants to hear something about um, suicide prevention, the first responder world, military. I've actually spoken at a military base, uh, and we know the record for military eighteen to twenty two. Uh, suicides a day which is just outrageous. staggering yeah i mean it's it's disgusting that's what it yeah. is you know uh so anyway we we can get we, we we can get we can get the word out we uh we get we get the word out what I, what I have learned chris is uh and i'm not patting myself in the back when i say that what i what i get i get two things one i get a lot oh my god wow i i, I hear what you're saying i get that because uh we keep it we keep it real we also uh we're big into the family aspect of that also that the family comes first, the job doesn't come first, family comes first. And I'm sure you can understand this. Hey, don't forget we, that ball game Saturday. Oh, you know, I just signed up for extra, extra shifts for Saturday. Now, what's that do? That pisses off your family, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but they've done that, yeah, you know? Uh, so family comes first. And, uh, but more so, it's just it's just just getting the word out. You know, we're on LinkedIn, we're on Facebook, Instagram, uh, all that. On my personal page, I'm always posting something about mental health or or anything like that, and and, and it's it's really great because we have such a diverse uh, group. We have uh, uh, one of our co-founders is Ron Clark. Uh, he's almost 80 years old. He's a retired Connecticut State Trooper, also a registered nurse and a mental health professional. This guy, this guy's got it going on. This guy, he he he's he's really cool. He, he knows what's going on. We have another member, uh, Therese. Uh, I worked with her dad. Her dad died by suicide five years after he retired. So Therese talks about the family aspect of, of the traumas of the job and uh, what's it like to be in the same house that uh, her dad died by suicide, how she found out about it, what happened that time, what happened up to this time. So she's big on the, on the family aspect of that. Uh, we have Nick out of Chicago. Uh, he's a mental health professional, so he handles a lot of our clinic, clinical stuff, for lack of a better word. Like, I can't go in there and talk... Hey, the chemical balance of the brain is this. I don't even know about that stuff. Right. Uh, and, then, and then my wife's also in the organization, but she's a she's a behind the scenes person. She she'll never go out on stage and talk or anything like that. But she does the behind, but you know, does our staff services, does uh, all that. So the point in my long winded way, I'm, I'm saying this is we um, there's a lot bigger uh, foundations out there than there are us. There's a lot of foundations, unfortunately, they're into the glam and glitter of it, uh, which you know, which which is wrong. Some, some, and some, fortunately, some organizations kind of exploit suicide to a point where, uh, and, that, and that's really sad also. So we're just, hey, we're just regular people. This is, we got, what we got to say, we can go into an agency, we can help them start up their peer support unit, we can help them fine tune their peer support units. Um, we, have, we, we have a resource page on, on our website. Um, we don't have a 1 800 number, maybe somewhere down the line we may, but not, not right now, but we have 1 800 numbers on our website that, um, and we 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 uh, we we look everybody that w- wants to connect with us. We're, we're really like thorough uh, uh, about it. Be honest, we're not politically correct. We just say it. We just, we just say it like it is. That's helpful but, in the first responder community. It, yeah, it's very helpful. Yeah, when, yeah what, what, once you drop a couple of f bombs, <laughs> right? It levels. You're pretty, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're pretty good at, at that point. <laughs> yeah. You know? uh, yeah. So yeah, we obviously we're professional, but but uh, but I think what makes us was was unique is everybody in the organization has been there and done that and i think yeah. that, that really goes a long way with us and uh we'll connect with anybody that we think is not, not a good fit 
or not a good idea. We have a lot of people, hey, I want to connect with you guys and we'll research them. And, and we, we just don't have that connection per se. You know, maybe we're biting ourselves in the butt by, by saying no to them, but you know, it kind of is what it is. So when you're moving through a, a an organization, um, you know, a police department, law enforcement agency, regardless, what what changes are you guys like recommending for um, enhancements to, um, you know, if you can't, you, you're not going to be able to, to, to stop it, you know, the, the PTSD from coming, but what do you, what, what are your recommendations? Maybe some agencies that are struggling, struggling with it, that, that have no sort of implementation um, of anything. What, what, what stuff do you guys recommend? So what we recommend is this is uh, we recommend it. We call it the annual mental health checkup. Every, everybody in the agency, whether it's civilian or sworn, uh, has a mental health uh, checkup with, with, a, with a mental health professional, obviously, whether it's an hour or two hours, ideally it'd be two hours, but an hour is fine. Now, that's a tough sell also. That's really a tough sell. Oh, I got I to go to the shrink tomorrow. Yeah, you know what I mean? And, you know, oh, you know, what, what are they going to say? What are they going to do? So we would recommend that because a healthy cop delivers a healthy product. Because if you look in the first world, there's all kinds of incentive for Hey, if you run a mile and a half and you bench press this and you do this, we're going to give you a paid day off and on and on. That's great. Absolutely. You should keep yourself in shape. Absolutely. But why are we doing that same incentives for mental health? Um, it, I, I think that that will, that will go a long way. It, but and we also want the agency to say, listen, we're not going to get rid of you. We're, we're going to help you. Uh, and, that, and that's difficult. That, you know, that, 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 that's a hard sell also because we, but I think the biggest problem we come across is, we just don't have the money for that. You know, now when you put a price tag on somebody's mental health or physical health wellness, you put a price tag on that, that's wrong. In the law enforcement world, they'll go out and buy this hundred thousand dollar SWAT van with all these guns on it and you know, bells and whistles. Do we need that? Yes, of course we need that. I, I, absolutely. But here's an idea. Why don't we spend a little bit of money on wellness for the officers? And uh and, and it also should begin at the academy. Ron Clark, one of the people I mentioned. He uses the line cradle to grave. So you should be receiving mental health assistance, mental health wellness, mental health knowledge from the day you walk into the police academy to the day you walk out that, that door at retirement. And also you should be, you should be uh, retirement is, is life changing. It's totally like life changing. So we, 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 we I, I go actually, I talk at police academies, but it's very hard sell. There's a 20, 21 year old kid. Oh my God, I'm going to be a cop. I'm going to go arrest everybody, lights and siren and all that stuff. And I'm up there. Hey, you know, this job could kill you mentally. They're like, what? Are you kidding me? He's running after that. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So, so I, it, it, begin, it should be beginning at the start, but you should never put a price tag on wellness whatsoever. Now, some of the suggestions we make to departments to say, Hey, listen, we don't have, we don't have money for a peer support unit. Well, here's an idea. How about doing a county support unit? Where, where you joined a bigger agency or, or something of that effect, or his idea presented to the city, presented to the town, presented to whoever, the squeaky wheel gets the oil. That, that's, that's, that's the bottom line. And like I said earlier, and I'll say again, a happy employee delivers a happy product. You know, oh, like 100%. Quite a bit. If I called 911, and uh, like I'm using the asthma example because I have asthma, if I called 911, and, and two firefighters walk in, they don't give a shit about anything. Hey, here's your rebuterol. How do you feel? All right. There's no empathy and compassion there. But if but if, if I call now when those two firefighters walk, hey man, let's we can get you through this and all that stuff, that goes a long way. In the police world, it's the same thing. I'll use an example. I, I went on a call uh, one night, 87-year-old woman got her mailbox ran over. That was the crime of the century for her. She was crying. What am I gonna do? How am I gonna get my mail? On and on and on. Now you have to put yourself in her situation for a second. So what a buddy of mine did, we, we when we cleared the call, we went to Home Depot. We bought a mailbox, we bought the stand, and the next day on our day off, we went there and installed the mailbox for her. Now we're not looking for a pat in the back. That's not what we're looking for. We didn't even tell our agency about that. It's called doing the right thing. So if you're doing the right thing for the public, guess what? The agency's going to do the right thing for you also. Now, could I mention that to my department? Got some that some nice little write up? Yeah, probably. That's just doing my job. That's that 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 that's that's all that. Yeah, but also that that like two things. One that speaks too to like the empathy that your leadership could have had. Like your at that time, you know, I don't know if you were a sergeant at the time, but if your sergeant or your lieutenant heard that, 
that is a, a, a sort of a responsibility on their part to make sure that that is notified to his leadership so that that goes in your file. So when it comes to accommodation time, it's not something that you did. You could be, you could be sharing that story over coffee, right? But right. it's the actions and the, the, the forward thinking of your leadership to say, you know, th that's going to go a long way when it comes to review time. Well, that's going to go a long way when it comes to that, that I know citations are coming up and you know, next year, that's a pretty damn good one. He doesn't have to know about it. I'm going to submit this one up. Right. Sure. And, and, and the other part too, when you said like the, the, that lady's emergency for that day, we see this all the time too. We got called for an, a, a lady having a panic attack and we show up and she couldn't find her cat food and her cat was going to die without food because she'll starve right. to death. That was true. And we went lights and sirens to it. And that was truly a 911 emergency. Right. And our crews were great. You know, afterwards, was that like, like, do, did they kind of look at each other? And, you know, was that shared around? Sure. But in the moment, our crews looked for cat food. And if they right. couldn't find it, they were going to go get it from the store. Because this was COVID time. Nobody could leave. Right. Mm -hmm. But in that moment, that's that lady. This might be the only time she ever calls 911 in her life. And why that matters is if we need more staffing or we're going to try to get our health care better or our retirement better. Right. That's going to be there's no one that there, there's no one that gossips more than firefighters and the elderly. Right. Yeah. And so cops also trust me. Right. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Sorry, trust me on that. Yeah. But when but when 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 it comes to voting time, you know, this lady's only only interaction with you was a couple of dickhead firemen coming in that didn't give a shit about her life. And the only thing she had in that life was that cat. Right. right. So, you know, in the moment I hear that story and it's, um, you know, uh, on service level, you know, it's this bullshit call that you go on and welcome to the fire service. But, at, but if you take a more empathetic approach to it, like this, this, this mattered to that lady. And, in, you know, when, as you were, you know, sharing your stories of what you went through, you know, I was going through, through the Rolodex of calls and it's always a, you know, I don't, I don't think the lay person, you know, that, that you're friends with or your wife's friends or your in-laws or whatever, I don't think they mean anything by the question of, oh my, you, you know, you're on the job, like, what's the worst thing you ever seen, right? Like, you know, they want, like, they are expecting to say like, you know, they want a funny kind of a kind of a funny ha. That's one. The, you know, this one time these two people were having sex, and then you know, you know, insert you know, you know, story. You know, I don't think, and I don't think they mean it like you know terribly, but that forces you to go into your rolodex of of all the buried trauma that you really don't want to think about. And then you're like, oh well, it was on Thanksgiving when I had to tell a a, a mom that her her son died from an overdose in the right. basement um yeah that was pretty that was, and then now you have this weird tense like interaction and this person was just trying to engage you in something they 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 think you want to talk about um but i think that just a um a, a part of the trauma that i don't think a lot of people have i think they we, we we tie it into something called a war story but i really think it's just this um you know long lineage of like you know you want to know why you're fucked up well you know you you just told me five you know i don't know if you guys do this in uh law enforcement but the fire service does you ever get on a weird fucked up talk it topic and then it's just this pinball pinball game of, oh, of course. your yeah. story like for oddly enough it's suicides is like oh you had this one oh do you remember back in 07 when we like we had this one guy and he did it this way oh man in, in 2011 we had this one and it's this pinball and it's this odd form of like this is fucked up conversation that we're having but it's an odd form of bonding too. It's really, it's, it's really a weird and sick and twisted way that like we like, are, it's a cope, but it's a really weird cope, you know? Oh, I can totally understand that. Totally, totally understand that, you know? And that's where you come together as a, as a team, as, as brothers and sisters, you, you know, you come with it. You, we got that, like I said earlier, we got that weird sense of humor. We got that, you know, we like to joke around. We like to ball bust and all that stuff. But in all reality, 
when the shit hits the fan, we come together as one. There's no question. There's no question about that. You, you know, um, if you don't come together as one, then you need to check out, man, because it's all about the team. So yeah. I, I, t- I, I totally get what you're saying. Cause I, I, you know, I'll, I'll talk with like, like we have a retirement group that I go to every Thursday. We go to lunch and we're talking about, Hey, remember, remember that call way back when? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And the story gets better every week. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, right. Yeah. yeah so, <laughs> someone did more, like, you know, right, right. We, always, we always joke like uh, a, a bullshit room and contents fire 20 years ago is going to be, I was saving the, I pulled that baby out Handed it to the mom. The mom gave me her number. I took the mom to a like it, it just it yeah. like it just yeah. snowballs into yeah. some crazy. Um, yeah, it's the same thing in the police world. It's the exact, it's crazy exact, story. exact same thing. One of then the you, best. Then another thing you always talk about also is you talk about that one boss. Hey, yes. Oh yeah, he was an asshole, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, or, or something like. And and you could talk about bad bosses for like five hours. Oh God, there's yeah, nothing better. Easily. There's nothing yeah, better, yeah. right? Oh, oh, I agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, Hopefully, my uh, people never don't talk to me like about me. Like, right, right. You know, and, and I will say one of the best things that 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 I have heard that it that I first heard about on the west side of Michigan, um, and I'm sure other agencies do it. It's not often though. It's kind of this unwritten rule, but I, I think it should become more of a common practice where if you experience a traumatic incident, and that's a very it's a it's a sliding scale term based on you know i guess the 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 interpreter but if you have and we all, i always use like a a pediatric trauma right mm-hmm. what's awesome is there's departments here and we're kind of implementing it too where if you are the crew that that experiences it what what we have done and it it's it's comes from a place of of, of genuine concern that that we do and i know other agencies do it too is we go to that crew and like we'll give them the option and say, listen, that was fucked up. That was a, a messed up call. Um, you get the option. Like you can go home right now. Um, you can stay at work, but if we get anything crazy, you can come, but you're not gonna be the one taking it into the hospital. Right. So what is awesome about that, and it's not a perfect fix, but it kind of removes their if they don't know what to do or they don't want to go home and, and feel weak or they still want to be a part of this 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 job this brotherhood and and you know in battle sort of thing um they can still go they can still help out but they're not going to be as you know involved or they're right. like, you know right, you know forward facing to another traumatic incident so it's one element that removes their ability to um try to get themselves back into it because one of the things I think we all experience, and I experienced this during the Oxford school shooting, I wasn't there. Um, but I had this weird thought that is, I'm glad I was, I'm glad I wasn't there, but I wish I was meaning, sure, sure. Uh, me, meaning I, I, I don't, I, I have no ill want, I have no want to see what, you know, my coworkers saw, but in a matter of supporting them and being part of that network to be, you know, involved with that. I have like this, 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 like this want that I wish I was there, but I'm glad I wasn't sort of thing. Right. Yeah. I, I, I can totally, I can totally understand that. That's what we talked about earlier was like, you know, the secondary trauma. Yeah. yeah. Really said, like I have a buddy of mine. He, um, I was out of state when the pulse shooting happened in Orlando. Okay. I was out of state. My department didn't respond to that. Uh, you know, obviously for mutual aid. Sure. Uh, a friend of mine was telling me that when he went inside, uh, pulse as he was walking into the uh, well, well it was in the club people you could hear phones ringing hear yeah ringing, but they're going to the threat that's what they're going to and but he said he distinctly remember that he, as he was stepping over a person they grabbed his boot and they were trying to pull him and they were saying save me and he had to walk past them yep now and, and, and that's that's serious trauma now and i was thinking as he's telling me that i was tearing up thinking about that because i couldn't visualize that like like it was me yeah, you know, and 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 it was just it was so vivid, and, and to this day, he, you know, he he struggles with that. He struggles with that actually quite a bit. And um, so, like, we, kind of going back to what we said earlier, like the public really doesn't really they know what we do, but to a point, they they don't know what 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 they do, what what we do. And that, and again, that's where we have to get that awareness out about mental health wellness because how can that not affect you? There's no way that can't affect you. Right. When he, when he after he, after they they neutralized the shooter, uh, he said he went he sat in the back of on the uh, the back of a fire truck. 
he took his boots off and they were spraying his boots off. And, uh, and he goes, that was traumatic. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it, it was. Now the general public, again, doesn't understand that. Now, every time he puts his boots on, what's he, he probably thinks about that. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. He, so, in, in maybe it's not like every time he looks at his boot, but, but his boots going to go into an orientation. He's going to throw his boots on a, a bay floor and spray them off and instantly yeah. be brought back to, sure. to that at random times. Absolutely. Sure. Sure. And I, I can think of times in my career, uh, going by a certain location. Oh yeah. I remember that call over there or, Oh uh, yeah. 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 Or, or, or just, just like, like in general, you know, it's something will trigger me a little bit or, or whatever. And again, that's why, you know, podcasts are so helpful. Conferences are so helpful is getting the word out for the public. that doesn't really, un again, they, 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 they know what we do to a point, but then to a point, they obviously they don't, you know, like, uh, like I hear, I, I hear, Oh, I met, like one time we're, we're at convenience stores, three of us at convenience store, a guy walks by, nothing better to do. Yeah. So, do you have, have any idea of what, 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 why we're there or, Hey, did you get a break at work? Cause we do. Yeah, we don't, we have to answer a call just like the firefighters. You can be right in the middle of dinner and the alarm goes off. This is the best steak I've ever had in a long time. And now it's sitting at the table, you know? And what do you think yeah. about driving to that call? You're thinking about that frigging steak. <laughs> you right. know? Yeah. So, so the public, so it's, it's, uh, it's all about public awareness, you know, and hopefully we can change the stigma. We can change the culture. We can stay, we can change a, a lot of things, but unfortunately that, that what I've learned also in the uh, police world is I'm going to use the George Floyd incident as an example after the George Floyd incident. Now, do I agree what happened with George Floyd? Absolutely not. No, no way do I agree with that whatsoever, but every cop, small town, America, Big cities, departments were all painted by the same brush, and the George Floyd incident uh, turned a lot of people against cops. Uh, celebrities, celebrities, politicians, athletes talking bad about the police, you know, and and that's really really sad. But that's traumas of the job, also, you know, and uh, so it's just tough. It's a, it's it's a it's a really really it's a tough job. There's no there's no question about that. If you said to me. I got sworn in on June 6, 1985. If you told me uh, on October 30th, 2023, you're going to be on a podcast talking about suicide, I'd be like, first of all, what's a podcast? Right. <laughs> and second of all, are you kidding me? You know, so this, yeah. this is why this is so important. It's so important in so many ways. Yeah. And I think too, Mark, like your, you know, your story, your openness, your message, I think it parallels, um, so well in the in in the fire service and you know to give a nod to law enforcement um i was sharing the interactions with uh you know how, the logistics and how our job works if we have a threat you know um you know a, a inside of a house or or whatever right and we get and we have to stage until pd makes it you know quote unquote safe right scene secure right. It, right. my wife you know <laughs> it's a nod to you guys my wife goes oh um so even if it, so if they're a little bit combative, you know, you, the, 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 the law enforcement goes in and then you go in. Go, well, yeah. Yeah. Just, so you're a second responder. And I was like, well, <laughs> I, I, I'm not like, and so I, I try to backpedal. Right. She goes, no, 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 no. Like, let, let, let's, let's focus on this. Right. And she's like, so, so, you know, they're fighting and what I'm like, well, we don't have really have the training or anything like that. And she goes, yeah, right. but you have like four guys you're showing up with and you have like, you know, a bunch of tools. I'm like, yeah, we still gotta yeah. wait. We still gotta wait, you know. Right, and right, so, right. so, so anyway, from from a second responder to to to, to you, um, I, I do thank you enough, um, Mark. You've given me a ton of time, man. I, I can't thank you enough. Where can where can people find um your um your organization? Um, get connected to it. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you, Chris. I appreciate it. You're not a, you're not a second, you're a first one. <laughs> I'm getting it. Because yeah, right. yeah. there's, there's terminology in police work. I don't know if you know what the ABCs of police work is. No. Ambulance before cruiser. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll leave it as that. <laughs> so, I love it. So, I love it. Um, but uh, my organization is Protecting the Guardian. We're on Facebook. We have a website. We're on Instagram. And we're on LinkedIn. And again, we uh, our, our job is to make mental health paramount in the in in the first responder world and for people to understand that trauma can happen physically it can happen mentally to all first responders and their families also so that's that, that's a big thing we we, we want to make a change 
but we can't make a change without the support of all first responders, families, the public, or whoever. We, we, we can't make change. The, the bottom line is, in the first responder world, we have our differences. You know, cops make fun of firefighters, firefighters make fun of cops. You know, that's, that's cool. I, I love that stuff. Don't get me wrong. But when the shit hits the fan, we all come together as one. There's no, literally no question, no question about that. And I'll just say this quick story, if you don't mind, Chris. No, go ahead. I was thinking, I, I was on a domestic one night, uh, which is one of the worst calls you can go to. Uh, I'm, in a, I'm in a crack house in a domestic, and I'm fighting this guy, trying to get this guy handcuffed. He's all cracked out. This is before tasers, and um, two firefighters were on scene, jumped in, helping handcuff that guy. That's not their job. But that went so that that went so far for me. I'm like, man, these guys these guys are really re really cool, you know, you know. And that so I say to say this, we're all in all into this together. But we can make a change, even though we have totally different jobs. To the point we have the same job also. Yeah, there's, there's no question about the guys. We, our job is to serve the public, but we yeah. can't serve the public if we're not mentally sound or physically sound. So yeah, I'll echo. I'll echo that we have a phenomenal relationship with 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 our deputies to the point that we had a we had a kid um turn up missing uh kind of wandering in neighborhood and it was me and the deputy that were going basically door to door oh cool to, is that man yeah the, looking yeah. for you know what happened to this and you know we tracked the 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 family down and you know that went the way it went but it was never a matter of well now well we're going to transport this kid deuces i'm out right. Right. It was this cop and, and I get it. Like he didn't want to like, he was apprehensive about going to this nondescript house. Like that's, that's a, that is a, a, a level of like uh, uh, apprehension that, that, that I give you guys all the credit in the world to go to a house that has overgrown foliage. There's, there's bed sheets over the windows. Um, but you know you have to go to that front door, and nothing about this house looks looks inviting. But right. you know, you know, uh, the other deputy was going to follow the kid down to the hospital, and make sure that all the reports were were filed that way, and we were you know going door to door looking for this this kid. So it was certainly a certainly a team effort that I think um, I think m our industry can do globally just because we have an okay relationship you know globally oh, i think be, you know absolutely. way better than what it is and i think it's it's getting better by the day i think it, i think it is too chris I, I i truly believe that but the only, way, the only people that can make it better is us 100 percent. and like i said earlier the squeaky wheel gets the oil when you're, you're in your career you're going to hear a lot more no's than you're going to hear yes unfortunately yep we can make change there's no there's no literally no question about, about making change slow and steady wins the race rome wasn't built in a day Hey, Amen. Yeah. Well, cool, Mark. I appreciate the hell out of it, man. Thank you so much. Um, Thank I wish you, you all the best. And we'll, we'll tell you and everything for it. And uh, okay. wish you well. Be safe, man. Yeah. Don't forget, Chris, to send me your address so I can send you uh, our care package. You got it, man. And okay, I'll do brother. the same for you. All right, bro. Thank you so much. God bless cool. you. Thank you. Right, take care, man. Thanks. Yep, you too. Bye. Awesome, man. I appreciate it, Mark.